perhaps we should. Thank you, Dr. Hermanani. Uh, so I make it three minutes past one. Perhaps we should just make a start in order to give ourselves time to ask questions as well. And I can mm -hmm. see that our speaker is ready. So I'll just do a very like a two second introduction because you do not need introduction. Um, so it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this very, very special research seminar in the School of Arts and Sciences. I've certainly been waiting to hear all about your research, Mr. Prescott, and it's going to be such a thrill to, to hear what you have to say. You have quite a fascinating title. I'm going to read it out and I shall not try to interpret it because I'm sure your, uh, your presentation will make sense of it. So the title of today's talk is Plethons, the Renaissance and Byzantium. And it's an analysis of the bilateral nature of relationships of Byzantine and Western thought and scholarship all the way up to the 15th century. Sounds fascinating. Thank you so much for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to put up the traditional slideshow. I know that um, this is not really good educational practice, but uh, it's probably simple. So here we go. Um, my purpose is really to try and gather feedback. So I'm hoping that there will be some questions at the end or comments or anything at all. I've been working on this on and off for some years now. And I thought I'd start by simply quickly introducing one or two of the concepts that I have um, and people that I'm going to be talking about, just in case some of you are not already familiar with them, though I imagine many of you are. The painting here of the procession of the Magi, the Corteo di Magi, by a painter called Benozzo, who was a friend, possibly a pupil of Fra Angelico, is in the Medici Palace. And it is basically a Medici statement of their success at the conference which had taken place some years before in Florence and Ferrara. The conference of Ferrara had ended with the reunification of the Eastern and Western churches, supposedly. And the Medicis were very proud of this achievement. The painting is in effect the sort of thing that you still get nowadays in photographic form, um, a formal statement of the political relationships at the Treaty of Versailles or Sèvres or whatever except that it's a fresco painted around a private chapel in the Medici Palace. It's allegorical to some extent. The Magi are almost certainly on the right-hand side of the Western Wall, either the Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund or just possibly in black there. Um, ju just possibly that might be the Patriarch of Constantinople. In the middle is the Emperor of Byzantium, John VIII, last of that name, Paleologos. And in the eastern section on the left-hand side of your screen, because that's how the picture was scanned, the painting was scanned, you have Lorenzo di Medici in cloth of gold in the center of the picture, and his father, the great Cosimo, on the left in black, riding on a donkey. The whole thing is a mass of complex political statements, which I don't have time or inclination to go into. Um, but basically, the conference boiled down to two issues. The first issue was the need to reunite the church after centuries of fighting over the filioque 
clause in the creed, um, not limited to West versus East by any means, because there were proponents and adversaries of the clause in both West and East. Um, and of course, to the emperor of Byzantium's desperate need to get money and arms and possibly soldiers out of the West in the last few years of the run up to the destruction of Constantinople. Of course, he failed from that point of view. So this is both a church conference and also a diplomatic conference, which is absolutely typical of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And it's also an academic conference because wherever churchmen gathered in great numbers, you could expect them to start to give lectures, seminars, and so on. If I just move on, no, sorry. Yes, if there we are. If I just move on so that we can see only the Eastern panel on your left, you can see the Medici family in front, practically all of them. And behind that, you can see bunched together in a little group in the left-hand side about halfway up, an important group of Eastern scholars and churchmen. Interestingly, one of the allegories or jokes or stories that's painted into this picture is immediately above, I'm sorry, above, above Lorenzo, who, who, by the way, shouldn't be here because he was only four years old, I think, at the time. But immediately above his head, there is one of those Renaissance hunts. And you may well be aware that a hunt is usually an image which carries a whole series of messages. They can be erotic. Um, the hunt for the fulfillment of love. They can also represent platonic love and they can represent the search for truth in dialectic, which again is very much a humanist or a platonic message. It's interesting that Benotti or Benozzi should have chosen that theme to put in with the Medici. On the right, we can see a close-up of these scholars. The artist has put himself, interestingly, in amongst the Byzantines. And just behind his right shoulder, the gentleman with the rather remarkable black cap and the beard, which my mother's hairdresser would have been proud of for its perms, is actually Plethon, the slightly mad scholar of Mistras. I'll be coming back to him very soon, but his importance is that when he showed up at the conference, he did so clutching a complete set of the works of Plato and proceeded, or, and possibly some Neoplatonists, and proceeded to give in ancient Greek, if you please, lectures on the subject, which were very well attended indeed, not least by scholars like Di Bruni and others from Florence, the two gentlemen in the black caps almost immediately behind the artist who actually appear in other parts of the painting as well. That's one strand of my story. The second strand is a series of complications and misconceptions that apply to the Byzantine world in general. The first, and I'm going to be very quick here, is Gibbon's decline and fall. Uh, the best way I can illustrate that is to point out that Google, a Google search produces one and a quarter million results or hits, if you like. 
Gibbon is still immensely popular, even after almost 300 years of publication, but he's also hugely problematic. He's popular because he's a wonderful writer, but he's problematic not only because of his hatred of Islam, but also because of the way he hated and put down Byzantium. To him, Byzantium was a weak civilization, corrupt and troubled by autocratic or even theocratic rule, doomed therefore to failure. Well, if it was a failure, okay, but it was a thousand year failure, which ought to count for something. And it probably was no more corrupt or less so than any other civilization of its time to speak of. Three more concepts that contribute to this series of problems. The first is Stephen Runciman's Crusades. Runciman himself admitted that this book, not admitted, but proudly admitted that this book was a work of literature rather than a work of history. But again, it's almost a standard text for many readers on the subject today, which is difficult because it very much represents the Western view, the view that the next book on this little collection, Edward Said, Orientalism so rightly pushes aside as being inadequate at the very best, maybe much worse. But while Orientalism does set the books right when it comes to the Western Orientalist attitudes, it also succeeds in largely ignoring Byzantium, again, as does Runciman. To Runciman, the Byzantines are just sort of in the way between the Crusaders and the East. To Edward Said, the Byzantines hardly seem to play a part at all. Uh, none of this can be quite right. Obviously, there are plenty of modern texts which do put this right. Vasiliev, Ostrogorsky, Peter Brown, Cyril Mango, to, just to name a very few. But they are mostly in the field of serious scholarship. There are very few that look beyond to the general public as yet. One other little element which will get in the way of understanding this is an oddity. It's the word Hellenism. We are accustomed by museums like the Neues Museum in Berlin here, but equally practically every museum that contains classical art or post-classical art in the world, including our own here in Beirut. They all have a Hellenistic period, but the word Hellenism was only coined in the 14th century. And it was coined not to express the idea of a period of civilization from the fourth century BC down to the uh, roughly time of Christ or Pompeii or whatever, um, but to express and to reject a certain type of scholarship which looked backwards to pagan authors. This may seem odd, but the word was then borrowed later in the 18th and 19th century centuries to express the concept of a Greek period from the time of Alexander and onwards. So there is considerable confusion with that one as well. Now, I'm going to move on very fast. I'm going to take you on a quick romp through the later Middle Ages and the Renaissance, or early Renaissance at any rate, and the scholarship of Byzantium and the Greeks and the West. 
I'm not going to cover everything on every slide, but I'll do my best to point out the highlights. The first thing is a neat simplification. It is possible to examine Western and Eastern viewpoints in terms of the textual canons that they used. In the West, you tend to get, in terms of epic, the Aeneid, and some reference to Homer, but the Aeneid certainly at the top of the list, whereas in Byzantium, Homer is well at the top of the list, the Aeneid hardly known at all. For example, um, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Tolkien's translation here, when the siege and the assault had ceased at Troy and the fortress fell in flame to firebrands and ashes, the traitor, that's Odysseus, who the contrivance of treason there fashioned was tried for his treachery, the most true upon earth. It was Aeneas the noble and his renowned kindred who then laid under them lands and lords became of well nigh all the wealth in the Western Isles in two easy jumps from Troy to the Mabinogio. Uh, similarly, in historical terms, schools and chronicles, chroniclers in the West tended to emphasize Caesar. a rather down-to-earth, um, simplifying method of stating events in chronological order. Thucydides, on the other hand, was much more popular in the East and tended to be studied as much for rhetoric as he was for historical value. And of course, in philosophy, the West was largely restricted to Averroan commentaries on Aristotle, whereas in the East, the Platonic and Neoplatonic texts never really disappeared. They existed along, coexisted alongside Aristotle. We would be in trouble if we weren't now to look at Italy very briefly. Roger I of Sicily and the Normans after him obviously are important in the connections of knowledge that were made between East and West, and scholars of Arabic and history have well pointed out that much of what came, came from the Arab world through these sources. But I would also point out that most of that material was in fact either mathematical or scientific, and that the philosophical material that came through people like George of Antioch tended to come from Greek rather than um, Arab sources. George of Antioch being typical multilingual and Antiochene, but certainly a Greek scholar first and foremost. In roughly the same period, we get the appearance of the first private universities typified by the first of all of them, the Alma Mater Studiorum, that's Bologna, of course. And here we tend initially to get a standard course of Western philosophy, Aristotle, and Western texts, Caesar, Ovid, etc. Simultaneously in the East, Greeks like Eustathios of Thessaloniki are studying Homer and actually provide the major commentaries of Homer, which are still in print today, as, for example, in the Venetus A manuscript, where you can see bits of his commentary interleaved amongst the text. 1204 sees the Franks take over Constantinople, and during this period, we begin to see a lot of trans transference of texts from east to west, from Constantinople to Venice, Rome, and elsewhere. I should back up a little very quickly and point out that porphyry in the west 
is really hardly known during this early period at all. A man called Calcilius had done a partial copy of the Timaeus in Latin, which was circulated, not very widely, but there, we know of about half a dozen copies in various libraries, three in England, actually. Um, Alfarabius, or Alfarabi, of course, noticed the spelling, which was the most common during his period, which is decidedly Greek rather than Latin, was clearly familiar with Porphyry, as was Abijana, um, who uses the Porphyrian, the Neoplatonic emanations. Um, in Sicily, in the 12th century, a man called Henricus Aristippus, a lovely combination of Western and Greek names there, wrote translations of the Minor and Ferdinand, but they're lost and they probably never circulated very widely. And in 1437, there's an error on my slide here. Uh, Leonardo di Bruni wrote several translations, several of which are lost, should not say all lost, because they're not. I was reading one just a little bit before our meeting. Um, but again, they didn't circulate very widely, and de Bruni ended up in prison um, when he fell foul of Cosimo de' Medici towards the end of his life, which didn't exactly help publication. In 1438, we get Plethon's lectures at Ferrara, and things really kick off in the last years of his life. He died either in 1450 or 1452. But this is the first time that the West is seriously exposed to these ideas in bulk. Now, let me move to the 13th century and to Constantinople, mostly. A man called George Acropolitis, uh, who had a pretty checkered career. He was Logothetis, that's to say, Minister of Finance. Then he was posted as the first professor of the University of Constantinople, Magaura, the Hall of Magaura, so-called. He started a rebellion, became emperor, was deposed, and ended as a monk with the wonderful name Jehoshaphat. In between, he went on a series of diplomatic missions, mostly to the West. He taught an important scholar, George of Cyprus, and he was a leading fighter in the cause against the Filioque. More important though, he also wrote history books in the style of Caesar, but using the rhetoric of Thucydides. This is the first man one can really find to whom you can point the finger and say this man is using ideas that belong strictly to the west and to the east at the same time. Not long after you get Planudis, a church scholar, an ambassador to Venice, who wrote a series of commentaries, one on Hermogenes, and another on Theocritus, and these, of course, are very much in the Eastern humanist tradition. But he also did a verse version of Aesop, explicitly echoing the Phaedrus Latin Aesop verse version of the, what is it, first century. Um, and he translated into Greek Western school texts, including Caesar, Ovid, Cicero, Boethius and Augustine. Boethius is interesting because, of course, Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy is already a Latin version of a Greek original through Symmachus from Aristotle. So here we have a chain from a Greek Aristotelian text to a Latin rendition 
of the ideas back into Greek again in the time of the late 14th century. What's happening, of course, is that after 1204, the Orthodox Church is taking more note of the Western Frankish world and is tending to pick up the educational canon, which will do them most good when they go out looking for jobs. No real surprises there then. <coughs> More Southern Italians in the middle 14th century now. Um, Barlam and Leontius Pilatus are both interesting. Barlam, because although he studied in Constantinople and eventually became a Latin church priest, met Petrarch and Petrarch possessed and was very, very proud of having a Greek copy of one of Plato's manuscripts. We don't know which one, unfortunately, and it wouldn't have made any difference anyway because Petrarch didn't know any Greek. We can only wonder whether Barlam, who was highly fluent in Greek as well as Latin, helped him at all with the text. Pilatus produced a long series of commentaries, very much in the traditional classicizing style, Homer, Euripides, Aristotle, etc. But he was also a friend of Boccaccio. So connections are growing here very fast. And at the very end of the Quattrocento, we have a man about whom we know almost nothing called Chrysoloras who in 1397 opened a language school for Greek in Florence, using Plato for his elementary texts, which gives me a good chuckle because when I was invited about a decade ago to teach Greek to a few friends in the philosophy department of um, AUB, we actually ourselves also used Plato for our initial texts. Anyway, Chrysoloras is obviously getting out of Constantinople while the going is good, taking, if you like, a year's leave without pay to see if he can get something going in Florence. And when he does, he brings about a dozen friends, all of them church scholars from Constantinople, to teach Greek in Florence, in Padua, and in Rome. Still, it's extremely limited, but we are now beginning to see Platonic texts and humanist ideas popping up here and there. And it's not at all long before Florentine scholars of one sort or another and Paduan scholars begin to use some of these ideas and discuss them in their writings. It's helpful to take a taxonomy that was created in the 1990s by Dinos Yanakopoulos. Um, he suggests that in Florence, there was a shift at the end of the 14th century from rhetoric to metaphysical philosophy. What he really means is that they began to study a great deal more of Plato for their school syllabus in the studium than had been the case before. That in Venice and Padua, the exam syllabus remained firmly Aristotelian, but that the old Western Averroist commentaries are beginning to drop out in favor of Byzantine commentaries. And this is certainly true because we see the Byzantine commentaries beginning to appear in Latin translations or redactions, at least, during this time. Rome, on the other hand, doesn't really get involved in these shifts at all, but does get involved in the production of better quality texts with a strong emphasis on humanist texts. 
and they also begin a major revision of the Vulgate based on a better reading than had ever taken place before in the West of the Greek Koine. The background to all this is that there are more and more Italian scholars who can read and even speak Greek and ancient or at any rate Attic Greek at that. Moving into the 15th century now, we see a split developing in Constantinople and other cities, Trebizond particularly. One group headed by Gregory Palamas are anti-classicist, anti-filioque, and pro-hesychast. The hesychasts are monks who believe in silent prayer, as for instance in Matthew, um, when you wish to pray, go into your room and close the door. They are biblical exegesists and hate anything that smells of paganism. One of their number, however, Nicolaus Cavasilas, is important in our terms because he actually translated the whole of Aquinas, Aquinas Summa Theologica. In the intervals between, his, between doing his main job as a bishop, an impressive operation. As an anti-classicist, it was he who came up with the term Hellenism. It was a term of opprobrium. Men who were Hellenists were potentially pagans and certainly not proper interpreters of the Christian faith. You have a whole group of people, Amiruzis, Bessarion, Trambizundios, who are increasingly bilingual in Latin and Greek and are capable of transmitting material from east to west. There's no need to go into detail for them, I think. But the empire is falling apart, and eventually this is where the last emperors end up. This is Mistras. On the left, it's about eight kilometers from Sparta, by the way, in the Moria. On the left is the Imperial Palace, that little fortified blockhouse with a formal classical garden complete with arcaded walkways behind it, a sort of echo of the ancient glory of New Rome. On the right, I kid you not, is Hagia Sophia, Mistras style. There's enough in here, the garbage can and half a tourist, to give you an idea of scale. Constantinople, it is not. Yet, Mistras, in some ways, was the most um, cultured moment of the whole of Byzantium, a swan song of high culture and peace and quality before the disaster of Constantine the 11th and the, his death at the walls of Constantinople. I pick only two of a couple of dozen significant scholars to show you what sort of thing was going on in Mistras. The first is a man called Tsikandilis, the a secretary to the emperor, John Cantacuzinos. He worked on, in Greek entirely, on Plutarch, Thucydides, and others, um, as though the world had never changed. George Yemistos, on the other hand, Plethon, as we often call him because he translated his own name, Yemistos means full up, to the more proper Attic Greek form, Plethon, which also means full up, lived for some years in Constantinople and then at Mistras. He was a humanist, he was a classicist, 
he was not quite a pagan, but very close. And he probably would have been accused of apostasy had it not been that he was well protected by the emperors. And he believed more in Neoplatonism, Porphyry, um, Iamblichus, and so on, than in pure Platonism, but was thoroughly familiar with both forms. He wrote at least one important manus manuscript, De Differentis, on the differences between Aristotle and, well, Plato or Neoplatonic thought, not clear how he perceived the differences, um, <clears throat> which was to become important because it provided access for a range of scholars to, um, to the basic principal differences between Aristotelian and Socratic thought. And he was the ambassador, the official ambassador, under the Patriarch to the Council of Florence and Ferrara. At the Council, he gave a series of lectures. We don't know how many. We do know that he gave them in ancient Greek, Attic Greek, which was probably a good move because most scholars of this time now knew Attic Greek very few of the Italians would necessarily have known the modern forms of, or then modern forms of later Byzantine Greek. And he seems to have impressed a large number of scholars. De Bruni, Sigismondo Malatesta, Poliziano, the poet, Landino, Della Mirandola, the politician De Becchi, um, but above all, Ficino, Marsilio Ficino, whose picture you can maybe see on the right if my screen is holding up. Anyway, um, Ficino got a group of these scholars together after Plethon had gone home and Plethon returned to Mistras, never to travel again, and died, hopefully, we think, in 1450, before the fall of Constantinople. But we have a nasty suspicion that he actually just barely lived to see that sad event. Anyway, Ficino went ahead, got a group of people together in an informal academy, a sort of uh, academic retreat. And they proceeded to translate and print all of Plato's works, note and print. Also Diogenes Laertius' Lives of the Philosophers, the Enneads of Plotinus, and various Neoplatonic works by Porphyry and Iamblichus, plus the Hermetica. Giovanni Cavalcanti published a speech on Platonic love. Others published important speeches on various aspects of humanism. And De Bruni probably ended up kicking himself because he never did publish his translation of the Apology. He had given up believing that Plato probably wasn't worth it, not quite logical enough. Whatever, I need only a minute to finish this because 1452 produced a stream of refugees from Constantinople, Trebizond, and elsewhere who proceeded to teach all over the Italian world. Bessarion almost became Pope, not quite. Um, Argyropolis taught Greek to Lorenzo il Magnifico de' Medici at the studium. Um, one of his pupils was Johann Reuchlin, which connects him directly to Luther and the Emperor Maximilian. Um, the poet Poliziano had his works published by Aldus Manutius, 
who, at the same time that Erasmus was working in those offices. The Chalcondylis cousins produced the first proper printed edition of, sorry, of um, Homer, and so on, and so on. The rest of the story can be found in a range of books on the spread of Plato and Platonic thought across the Western world, but frankly, that goes beyond my discussion. The issue here, closing down, is very simple. To me, it's not about West versus East. It's not about Christian West versus Arab world. It's about piggy in the middle. It's about Byzantium. Byzantium was the point of contact. Byzantium produced the scholarship that made the connections possible. But that last, of course, is an opinion and a fairly left-wing way out opinion at that. So I'll close down here and ask if we have any questions. Um, I think Thank that's you. enough. Hopefully. Thank you very much. Thank you. I love those famous last words. Yeah, well, I hope there are some. <laughs> I love it. Uh, they're both, they are like that conference that you started with, academic and political. I don't think they're religious. <laughs> no, but there's very little religious in this. Um, the, the excuses are often religious. And the filioque is an issue and has been for centuries. Uh, but it's not a cut and dried east-west issue. Paris was not saying the filioque right up to the end of the 14th century. Mm -hmm. um, and there were priests in Constantinople who fought over whether or not to include that word in the creed right up, right up to the fall of Constantinople. Um, so it's not really about these theological issues at all. It is political and it is cultural. It's cultural in the sense that what I've just captured are, if you like, the scholars who slowly but surely over a period of centuries and culminating with Pleathon fed these ideas into the mainstream of, well, what we have today as university culture, frankly, if you like. So yeah, it's academic. I can too. see that. Yes, I can see that. Well, thank you very, very much for a very uh, thought provoking presentation. There were so, so many moments where I thought, oh, that could lead in so many different directions. So we will open the floor for questions. Um, if for some reason I disappear, it's because Ogero has decided to cut me off, but I do come back. <laughs> it's what I used to say to my child, when mommy leaves the room, she's gonna come back. And so I will just uh, kindly ask Dr. Behmadi if I disappear to please hold the fort <laughs> while I come back. Our ta talented student, Vicky Panossian from English has a question for you. Vicky, over to you. Uh oh, this will be a tough Hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> uh, I'm good. I actually have a question. I've been meaning to ask this. Like, ever since I saw the post, uh, poster, it's the first thing that came to mind. Um, I'm currently reading the history of Fasburagan. It's uh, I'm reading the Armenian version, so it's like it's supposed to cover the timeline from ancient to 1910, something like that. And I noticed a pattern throughout, which is uh, people like Plethon and sorry, I'm referring to the Armenian version, so it's kind of hard to translate. Uh, so people like him are not valued and like relatively trashed. There are footnotes of him being hated on, but his comments on Plato and Aristotle are still used to explain the reality of people living in the ancient world when it comes to Armenia, uh, no, ancient Armenia. So I wanted to ask, why is it that his thoughts are so discriminated against but Plato isn't. So like, what, what creates that distinction? Okay, I have to go out on a limb here because I'm not quite sure. But um, 
uh, the most of the Eastern churches um, were aligned with the anti-Hellenes. Uh, they were aligned with people like Grigoris Palamas, whose picture, by the way, you will find in quite a few um, churches around the Armenian world. Uh, so I suspect that this is a very general thing. Now, Grigoris Palamas had a copy of Plithon's De Differentis. In fact, the copy that we have today is a copy which contains Grigoris Palamas personal autograph scribbles. That's wrong. That's dreadful. This kind of thinking is not logical. Um, how can you say that about women, etc., 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 sort of comments. Um, so I think you will find that your Armenian churchmen of the late 15th century would have been seeing these ideas through the spectacles of anti-classicists, um, who had worked at Constantinople and not through the lens of um, the new Florentine scholarship at all. Okay. But I would have to stop and read carefully to not least read the history book, which you've got and I haven't, um, to, to confirm that. Okay. But, but that would certainly be my first first reaction and the, the most likely place to go, if you like. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, as Dr. Behmati has stated in the chat, uh, you can use reactions to raise your hands, write questions in the chat, or just, you know, unmute yourselves and speak. Um, in the absence of anything, of anyone there, um, I, have, I have a question that is not very well thought through. And it's come out of what I heard from you now. I was just a bit curious. At the start of the presentation, you were trying to show which narratives were prevalent where. And you were saying, for example, or no, I'm sorry, Fogero just stole your voice. I didn't hear that last bit. Uh, we can't hear you. I'm back. You've broken no. up. Oh. Can you put your query in the chat? You've broken up. Maybe you can stop the like voice can be better. Okay, uh, I have a question, uh, Brian, if, uh, if I may. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, in fact, I have more than, than one question, but I'll start with the uh, one which is uh, major for. First of all, it's very interesting how, uh, in fact, between the 13th century and the 15th uh, century, the whole uh, Eastern world has changed by the uh, fall of Baghdad in uh, 1258, and the fall of Constantinople in 1452, almost exactly uh, 200 years between both, and the two major capitals of the Eastern world, uh, you know, changed their identity. And interestingly, both of them, uh, you know, were, uh, let's say, invaded, and they fell as a result of the uh, Mongol or Turkic Turkic race. So the Mongols, Sulaco, in fact, invaded uh, Baghdad and the Ottomans invaded uh, Constantinople. And both, in fact, go back to the same uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, background. But my question is more about philosophy. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, Avicenna and Averroes, uh, Alfarabios, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, medieval uh, uh, Muslim uh, philosophers whose works were translated into Latin, I believe, yes. uh, and uh, they were introduced uh, to universities in uh, Europe. Now, as far as we know, the, uh, the, 
I mean, Abyssinia or Averroes or Al-Farabi, when uh, they wrote their uh, philosophy based on what they assumed as Aristotelian or Platonic uh, philosophy, they wrote it in a version or th their concepts were not exactly identical to what Aristotle was saying or what Plato was saying. Even they mixed between, in fact, Plato and Plotinus, and in fact, uh, even between Plotinus and Aristotle. So in fact, the main, uh, 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 the most uh, popular philosophy book, which they used as, in fact, the book of uh, uh, Aristotle, was in, uh, actually by Plotinus and the, you know, yeah long story, uh, uh, the Indians. So uh, my question is that when uh, this, uh, and you mentioned that there was a kind of uh, assimilation between the Greek philosophy in Europe and the philosophy which in fact was trans uh, transferred to, uh, to Europe uh, by the Arabs or, or uh, the Arab or Islamic philosophy which was transferred uh, to Europe. Now, this mixture, didn't that result in a new kind of uh, philosophy in medieval Europe, which was, in fact, a mixture of what is uh, real Greek Aristotelian Platonic philosophy and the Islamic version of philosophy, and both resulted in a different philosophy in uh, Europe, which was, in fact, a mixture of uh, both philosophical schools, which both, in fact, considered themselves as Greek or Aristotelian, but one was not really uh, purely uh, Greek or Aristotelian, and the other one was a pure Greek and Aristotelian. What was the outcome of this assimilation of these two uh, branches of philosophy? Okay, there are several questions in there, I think. Um, the, the first is a, a simple yes. Uh, the texts thought to be Aristotelian in the 10th century or thereabouts um, and the 11th century were not all Aristotelian and of course even the ones that were Aristotelian were not necessarily available in very good versions. Mind you that's still true because the bulk of what we have of the Corpus Aristotelicum it is in fact um, student notes basically, um, and wildly varying in quality from straight A student, the straight A student who wrote the first couple of pages of the metaphysics to the ghastly D minus job who, who, who incorporated some platonic ideas that he must have heard somewhere in a cafe at the end of the same book. Um, the, th this is obviously even worse in the time of people like Avicenna. Um, and you do indeed get quite a lot of Plotinian and uh, Porphyrian thought. Plotinian is not too bad, but Porphyrian gets complicated because it becomes mystic. Um, the, who is it? I think it's, yeah, it's Avicenna who offers a definition of aporoi, a flowing out. Um, of all things for which there are three primary hypostases, the one or intellect, the nous, uh, or mind, if you like, and the soul, the psyche, or whatever, the breath. Um, this is absolutely antithetical to any kind of creationism. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't fit well with biblical or Quranic exegesis either. It's precisely these texts that got those Muslim and Jewish scholars like Maimonides, for instance, into trouble later on, first with the Muslim church, with the Muslim uh, scholars, and then with the Christian church as well. Uh, on the other hand, the methodologies, the commentaries um, did persist. And as they got better quality editions of, Arist of the corpus, uh, so, so the same commentary methodology was applied over the following centuries 
um, leading you eventually in the direction of people like Aquinas, of course, um, and on into the emphasis in Rome at the end of the Trecento, beginning of the Quattrocento, um, on the need for better editions and so on. And that's where the crossover begins to take place. That's where people begin to realize that there may actually be some use in the Platonic and Neoplatonic texts. On the other hand, at the beginning of the 14th century, you have people like De Bruni publishing, he published a copy of the Timaeus, um, quite a good copy. And instead of the usual adulatory remarks for his, um, for, for his financier, the De Medici, at the beginning, he kicks off with a paragraph explaining how you have to keep Socrates and Plato mentally separate, otherwise you're not going to understand what's going on. He's really not able to assume any knowledge at all of these texts. Um, he has to assume that his readers are going to have to be spoon-fed every single item, and he does so in his introduction. And then later on, he backs off. Plato, he argues, is not logical, at least not in an Aristotelian sense logical. Certainly, there is no um, deductive logic available in Plato. Therefore, Plato is inherently dangerous and may go against Christian values of proper exegesis. If you try to take these kind of intuitive steps into the exam rooms of the schools in the studium or elsewhere, you are unlikely to come out with a passing grade. And it will be another easily 50 years before people began to realize that it's not about the logic, it's about the dialogue. That's the thing that really comes out when Plethon's lectures have been given and people start to really publish the bulk of the Platonic material as opposed to the Neoplatonic. And slowly you start to see, there's a lovely description of this in a book um, sorry, uh, help, where's my reading list? I have a reading list floating around somewhere. Um, there's a lovely description of this process in refs. Doctor. That should do me. Uh, what's his name? I'm sorry. S -s 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 no. Hankins. Plato in the Italian Renaissance. There's a lovely description of this process in that book, spanning a couple of chapters, uh, which, which basically um, tells you how they begin to weed out the more mystic elements and go for the go, go for the basic uh, processes of Socratic of Socratic dialogue and so on. Anyway, um, I don't know to what extent that answers the question. Um, it is the area where I am still in some difficulty. And you're right, of course, that I should probably have included the fall of Baghdad in this overall picture. If I can just pop my screen up again um, for a moment. Share, click, share. The gentleman top right in the rather magnificent black flower pot with golden patterns is said to be a member of the Chaldean church between the rivers. Said to being the operative phrase because none of these people except the artist actually have labels on, but it's a wonderful thought that this might actually be a representative of the church of the Chaldeans in Mesopotamia at that conference in Ferrara, at least in the imagination of Benozzi. <laughs> uh, 
I don't know. Does that answer your queries? Yes, yes. Can I ask a very small question, Dr. Shnainati, uh, which is not directly re relevant to the uh, topic, but it is related to Greek language. Uh, and Brian, since you know Greek, uh, once when I was in Athens, I uh, bought, uh, in fact, a, a Greek translation of Plato, of Plotinus' uh, Aeneads. I'm uh -huh. just wondering how different is, uh, you know, classical uh, Greek compared to uh, modern Greek? Is it to that extent, is it, has it changed so much that they need to translate uh, Plato's works, uh, Plotinus' works into Greek so that, I mean, uh, current uh, uh, Greek people can read it? Uh, yes. Uh, until about 20 years ago, classical Greek was still a required subject in high schools. Um, but it didn't go very far for most pupils. They dropped it. They reintroduced it a couple of years ago. I'm not quite sure exactly when. Um, so it is now taught again, but only in a very, very limited way. And it's only the students who wish to follow the classical strand who, of their version of the baccalaureate um, who will continue to study classical Greek properly. The church Greek which belongs mostly to the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries after Christ, um, is sufficiently close to classical Greek to serve as a, set, a stepping stone, if you like. A priest with a decent education and a good knowledge of biblical Greek can fairly easily acquire classical Greek as well. What was going on in the Byzantine Empire was that classical Greek was never forgotten. The school curriculum was in classical Greek, and this is similar in some ways to the Arabic um, formal written tradition of the language in modern terms, except far more extreme because you're really suggesting that your curriculum is in a version that belongs in the fifth century before Christ, 2,500 years old. But no, it's, it's different. There's an awful lot of different vocabulary. The grammar has changed beyond reason. Um, <clears throat> ancient Greek has datives um, which, are no longer, which no longer exist. Um, it has a wonderful and very, very fluid range of verb forms, which have almost all disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, on the other hand, because most of modern Greek law is written in very ancient, very formal language, it's not hard for a modern Greek to access not as it might be hard for an Englishman to access um, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for instance. Mm. Okay. Thank you. So Arabic is uh, now the oldest living language in the world. We can <laughs> I suppose that's an argument. Yes, yeah. what about Arabic? Arabic now is the oldest living language in the world. Perhaps, yes. So Dr. Jainati, take this into consideration, please. Yeah, <laughs> I have a query from Dr. Zinaynati. Um, it's forefront in my mind. About Homer on the chat. Um, the, yes, different epics in different civilizations because they're available in different languages. But don't forget that Homer was always regarded as the ultimate source of epic and source of literature in the West not just in the Greek world, but in the Western world as well. Um, so the choice of Homer as a starting point for these things is a natural one. It's there, it's in the school curriculum. You can't get away from it. Um, but both translations- Conservative school curricula are, right? Mm. Sorry, no, yes. I appreciate that, but I, I'm always wondering to what extent these were political strategies because 
the stories promoted a nationalist uh, perspective, for example. So if you translated it from one, uh, from one language to another, the political message was still safe. Or to what extent were these based on literary merit? that you are translating something to show the how grand uh, a civilization was, how lofty its aims were. And I think there's a tension there. I'm just never really sure which way to go with it. There is some tension. Um, I, th I think you, actually I can come right home to roost and suggest that um, you should read Plato's Eon uh, if you really want to understand what the, what Homer meant at any rate to the Greeks. Homer is a statement that the Homeric epics are a statement of their civilization. At, at the simplest level, the, 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 the Iliad is, a, is an anger management course. I like that. Achilles, Achilles has to learn how to control himself, how to do it properly in a civilized manner. Only then can he be at peace with the gods and die. Um, but the other side of the coin, the, the, the ultimate extreme, if you like, is still very much with us today. It's the concept that some of my students bring to their classes, um, that the Iliad is really Br Brad Pitt killing a lot of Trojans, uh, very heroically and very successfully, and therefore the Greeks are obviously the most successful people around. Not a god in sight. Uh, <laughs> the, the, there are many, many, many ways of approaching the great epics, um, and many of them have been tried and tested over the centuries. I, I would expect, and indeed there are, political uses made. There's a lovely translation done in the Epirus in the 12th century from ancient Greek to the Greek of the Middle Ages. Uh, which is basically designed to suggest that the people of Western Greece, Northwestern Greece, were the bee's knees. <laughs> yeah, um, but that's a political statement in itself, yeah, right? That's, that's right, that's a political yeah. statement. Um, but then there are, other, there are so many other statements, um, statements about the gods, statements about the nature of Greek culture, about rhetoric, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And many of these translate into Western culture without any significant difficulty at all. Yeah. Um, and that's why it becomes a touchstone point for these things. The same for Thucydides. Once, in the, once the West wakes up to the possibilities of rhetoric, outside of Cicero and uh, Quintilian, they, they really realized that um, new versions of history books and rhetorics and so on are going to be needed. Uh, and of course, philosophy is another matter altogether from that point of view, much more complex and indeed again, as much political as it is the, as it is either theological or philosophical, really. And metaphysical would be the word I'm looking for. Anyway, uh, yes, I really I like, there, um, there, there is a tension there, of course. I really like the explanation that you gave about the anachronistic introduction of the hunt in the original uh, painting. Oh, that's I quite like that. And um, lots of those. There's, there's a beautiful painting of the hunt. I, I, is it by Caravaggio? I can't remember. Of course. Uh, in the National Gallery. Of course. And I wanted to ask you about that because um, one of my colleagues uh, in my previous institution wrote a lot about the hunt in medieval literature. Her name's Catherine Bates. And one of oh, her yeah. books, yes, a fantastic book. And obviously, I mean, uh, we, were, we were housemates, so I know everything about that book because uh, oh, okay. she used to read passages out. So here's the thing. I was quite interested in that in the transposition of that image on the edge of the painting because the animal that's being hunted looked like a like a doe or it looked yes, like a quite in, mm, it wasn't a hunt for a lion and but you're it's absolutely not the, it's not on the edge of the painting it's slap bang in the middle of that wall right the, the three were together the, no uh, you're looking at the, let me pop the picture up. Um, oof, where's my 
There it is, share screen coming up. Not coming up, I missed. That's better. This on the left is one wall of the chapel. It's one full wall. So when you turn to look at that wall, the hunt and Lorenzo in his cloth of gold, a slap bang in the middle of the wall. They are oh. frame. So the hunt is absolutely central to this picture. If I reverse back to the overall picture, which shows the west wall, the, I think, south wall and the east wall, uh, <laughs> the north wall is a tiny little scrap because it's a weird wedge-shaped room. Um, on the right, you can see the probably Homer, Holy Roman Emperor and most of the Western churchmen forming a proper procession, a very ordered and logical procession all the way up the mountain. Um, on the left, this procession really doesn't exist. Instead, you have the Medici family in the front, a small number of mostly Florentine bishops and clerics, and a strong contingent from the Eastern Empire, um, from New Rome, if you like, and no clear sense of a formal procession. The logic is broken. Instead, you have the hunt. All right? Yes. Yes. So I think this is, I think this is actually how at least Benozzo and probably the um, and probably Cosimo de' Medici, who commissioned this thing, actually perceive the the difference in the two philosophical methods, if you like, and academic methods. The school method on the right is one of logic and formation. The school method on the left involves the hunt a search for knowledge which cannot be easily defined or placed within deductive logic. Love it. And therefore a Socratic search. And they're all chatting to each other. It's a dialogue. Have yes. A look, have you a look at this nod. <laughs> yes, it's really, it's captivating. I don't it's want to hold the conversation. Dr. Bella actually has a question in the chat and she was wondering if the West is still in, no, 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 she, you answered this one. There's another one. Sorry, Here how can we make, how can we make yeah. Oh, I don't think you need to teach Plato. Nowadays it's Socrates you need to teach. We need to hold on to Socrates. The dialogue is forever. Um, Socrates' last words, I can hear the cockerel crowing are really the magic to end all magic. The cockerel is the, uh, and, and the, sorry, no, not I can hear the cockerel, sorry. What is it? Oh, yes. Speaking, he says, don't forget to pay for the cockerel to the priests of Asclepius. Which is weird. But what is Socrates doing suddenly remembering the god of healing of the ancient world, but not weird at all when you realize that you pay for your healing process in the temple of Asclepius by giving the priests a cockerel. It's the fee for admission to the temple. You spend the night in the temple, which is full of snakes and all sorts of things in the dark, and the priests, in the meantime, sacrifice their cockerel and go and have dinner. In the morning, when they open the gates of the temple and you come out, cured of your sicknesses, what is the first thing that you hear in the village near the temple? And the answer, of course, is the cockerel crowing, because there's always a cockerel crowing, including the one that lives in the next door garden to my house. 
there's always another question. There's always another answer. That's the nature of dialectic. And that's what Platon was selling. Therefore, the answer is really simple. Keep the dialogue going. Then you are keeping Platon alive. Keep the questions coming. I don't know, does that answer it, uh, Luma? Yeah, beautifully. I like that. Okay, well, there you go then. Um, Platon's De Differenti is, is not a text for the beginner. It's a complicated beast of a thing with chunks of mysticism all mixed up with chunks of real solid uh, Socratic thought and actually a very good expose of the basics of Aristotelian thought. Um, but it's not something you would want to walk into a classroom with unless you want to give everybody a serious headache. Um, what you want to do is keep the dialogue coming. That, after all, is what Socrates was all about in the first place. Oh, thank you for that. Any other questions? Wonderful. So it's uh, 20 past two. Yes, Almost I'm time sorry. to wrap I up. You have made it go too long. <laughs> Thank you so very much for a very thought-provoking. I see. I don't know why my camera is not working now, but at least voice is working. Um, so <laughs> I would like to thank you without uh, you seeing how happy I am to have uh, listened to this fantastic and thrilling talk. And we hope we can welcome you again next year, please, for another follow-up talk. I hope so too. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thanks for everyone. For, for attending and for engaging. You can see the positive feedback on the chat. Yeah, I've already got the Have a lovely I've weekend, everyone. <laughs> keep me busy for a while. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Have a lovely weekend, everyone.